Welcome to America Daily's Focal Point. This is Pamela Sai from New York. In today's episode, we're going to talk about what has caused a growing interest in socialism among young students in America. For those who are familiar with the history, socialism has been proven to be a total failure after almost a century of experiment in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. On November 9, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall marked a historical milestone. As West Germans celebrated the unification of Berlin, they abandoned communism and embraced the free world. As a leader of the free world, America played a monumental role to the ending of the Cold War and the disintegration of the communism in both Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. But in just 30 years, an incredible change has been taking place in America. Today, more millennials wanted to live in a socialist society than capitalist one. Some are even interested in communism. What happened and caused the change? Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation began tracking the attitudes towards various political ideologies among millennials since 2016. The latest results in 2017 suggest that 44% of the millennials wanted to live in a socialist society, 7% want to live in a communist society. That means more than half of the young Americans prefer socialism to capitalism. The percentage of millennials who prefer socialism to capitalism is a full 10 points higher than that of the general population. It was very surprising uh, that you know, young people who have been fortunate enough to have been born at a time of unprecedented prosperity and freedom in the most prosperous and free country in human history uh, could long for or think that they'd get a better deal uh, under a system that the last century has shown delivers nothing but uh, human misery. Their knowledge of communism is not is not great. Um, most of them are quite ignorant of the subject. Um, some of them might um, think it's think it's it's a it's a viable option for them uh, for a, you know what, what they would favor in the political system. But I find that once um, you walk them through some of the history of these regimes, um, some of the horrible um, sufferings that uh, citizens who lived under communist regimes went through. Um, that sort of challenges their assumptions about what might make sense and um, you know I, f I find them to be very responsive um, to my teaching. Indeed, the results have shocked so many Americans as the leader of the free world who have fought communism so hard. How did America come to this stage? As a university professor, uh, you know, I was teaching political science and I was confronted on a year-to-year -year basis with the complete ignorance of history amongst today's young people. Uh, I mean, one of the most shocking was that most of them have zero real recollection of, of something as recent and significant as September 11th. The temptation after 1989 was to think, well, the Cold War is over. By 91, the Soviet Union had collapsed. And it was very easy to think, well, um, you know, the, the West won and, and the fight is over. And, and so I, I find that, that students just are not exposed to that history anymore because people think it's ancient history and we don't need to be confronted with that stuff anymore and it's nothing that people really believe in anymore. So if you look at the K through 12 curriculum, uh, what you generally see is that when we teach our own history, we teach warts only. So it's just the evils of our own history. So we teach about the evils of slavery, the evils of Jim Crow, as we rightly should, but we need to be able to teach our history warts and all, including the good stuff, so that we can appreciate you know, the monumental success that a contemporary American society represents. I think it's, uh, I mean, it's partially just naivete on their part. I mean, it's, it's partially this tendency to look poorly on one's own society, right? They're, they want to um, prove themselves to be um, somehow hypercritical of their own, their own country. You know, it's not cool to be patriotic. It's not cool to be too excited about 
about the United States of America. And so it's, it's partly just a posture of, of kind of knowingness that they want to demonstrate their intellectual superiority by, by um, showing people that they, um, they have this very detached, critical attitude towards their own country. Today, patriotism and traditional American values seem to be banal and out of date. And yet socialism or communism seem to become a cool and new darling to the young American people. When you're looking at when we teach the history of something like China or the Soviet Union, what we tend to do is we try to focus on the few positive things that do happen there. No system produces nothing but terror and, and, and horribleness. There's always, beauty is you know, like a weed that can grow up through anything. You will find instances of nobility and goodness that you can talk about. But you have to, in talking about those, also talk about the broader context, which is one of terror and horror and human degradation. Uh, and we fail to do that. Right? And so when we talk about Stalin and the sacrifice of the Russian people and of the other Soviets in the Second World War in defeating Hitler, we have to at the same time also talk about the role of Stalin in starting the Second World War and you know, the, the innovation of the gulags and the concentration camps and the knowledge transfer that took place between these two totalitarian systems. You know, they helped each other to better oppress their people. And similarly, between the Soviet Union and, and China, you know, there's a knowledge transfer that takes place. You know, how better to terrorize, how better to oppress, how to do it better. And we see this today with communist China, where they try to export the China model, where they are currently building a more perfect totalitarianism by leveraging the power that information technology and artificial intelligence and mass surveillance allows to create a panopticon, a, a prison without walls where everyone behaves as though they're, they're constantly being watched. Curriculum is only part of the problem. The mainstream media hasn't been helpful to exposing the hidden facts about socialism. I have tried to share my stories in the sense that got in touch with people trying trying to get uh, the word out, especially during 2014, 2015, 2016. But it, it was very difficult to connect, and it was basically in, impossible to, to find it. So no, I, I haven't been to any mainstream. So I think that this is a good example because it is a fairly decent show. Uh, John Oliver last week tonight had a, had a coverage on the Venezuelan situation where they presented some figures that were right, and overall the story was okay. It was just produced uh, a couple of months ago. But then they ran the argument and they made it seem like the economic crisis that Venezuela was going through um, was due to the low prices in, in the oil barrels. And that is a complete lie. Um, and it is not only a lie, but it misinforms people and it's omits the responsibility of the regime in the economic catastrophe that the country is living currently. And also they, they made Chavez look like a champion of the poor and not like the uh, causal force of poverty and death and hunger that, that he actually was. Venezuela was once a strong and prosperous democratic nation, the brightest economic spot in South America. Since the election of Hugo Chavez in 1998, who set the country on a course of socialism, Venezuela began a disastrous path to chaos, oppression, and total failure, both politically and economically. Look at Venezuela, rich country with a lot of oil, after having an incredible amount of money on their hands. The regime managed to turn a growing economy into an economy that has 16,000% of inflation and that it's uh, the, with a GDP decreasing in 50% 50, 50 in four years, for example. The government controls all the media, directly or indirectly. So all the TV was 
the TV or the all the TV stations were progressively bought out or expropriated by the regime in a frame of 10 years, um, over 2,000 radio stations as well. You know, you know that the gov the regime is looking at your emails, that your phone is tapped, that you are followed by a police car constantly, that every time that you go to a demonstration or that you go out of your house, you have someone filming you, and when you go and talk to them, you are met with basically violence. There, there is no, you need to allow them to film you constantly. Um, I, I have friends that have been in jail, that have been tortured. I have one student leader uh, companion that was killed by the, we believe that by the regime, he was killed under very suspicious uh, circumstances right after the um, demonstration, for example. And it's hard for Enrique Altimero to understand why his American counterparts would be so enthusiastically interested in socialism. Basically, I would say to them, first of all, to look at the evidence, what has happened in all the communist countries in the world, how things have unfolded, how freedom have, has diminished, how you lose your autonomy, the possibility of doing your life, of seeking your happiness. So what happened to the socialist societies? Let's take a look at some figures and facts from the two groundbreaking series written by the Chinese American scholars who have actually lived in a socialist society which is controlled by the world's largest communist party. The Nine Commentaries on the Communist Party, The Ultimate Goal of Communism. Socialist China. Since Communist Party took over of China, it has killed between 60 to 80 million people. From 1949 to 1958, the anti-revolutionary movement killed 2.5 million, according to the party's own statistics. In socialist Russia, since Stalin took the power, more than 60 million people were killed in the Great Purge. More than 85,000 Orthodox priests were shot in 1937 alone. In socialist Cambodia, between 1.7 to 2.5 million out of roughly 8 million total population in 1975 were killed by the Khmer Rouge regime. Socialism gives paramount power to the government. The state has absolute control of its country and its people. In China, the Communist Party controls all media. It's illegal to have independent media free from the state control. It's illegal to attend churches not sanctioned by the state. There's no freedom of information and internet is strictly censored. And it's illegal to express grievance against the government. Political dissidents are sentenced and jailed. More than 100 million peaceful Falun Gong practitioners have been brutally persecuted since 1999. Hundreds of thousands have been jailed, tortured, and many have been persecuted to death. Socialism or communism has long been considered a bad or evil ideology in the West, especially in a free and democratic society such as America. So what has caused the shift in public opinion towards socialism? Besides education and mainstream media, what else could have contributed to the growing positive perception of socialism in America? There is a strong reason that the Chinese government is called the Chinese government. They call it the Great Wall Street. Because I have worked for 20 years in the Chinese media, so I know they are very clear about this. It is divided into two parts. The first thing is that the Chinese government has spent a lot of money to buy or control the media outside the foreign media. 或者呢，他们与海外的主流媒体建立很好的合作关系，来影响他们。第二个方面呢，就中共和美国的高校进行合作。大家知道，在美国大概有一百多所孔子学院，这学院是中共跟美国的高校合作办的，它里面宣传的是中共的一些政策。还有一个方面呢，就是中共派出大量的说客，他到美国政府来游说，希望能影响美国政府的一些政策。所以呢，在美国生活的人，你就会越来越多的听到。中共好的声音，哎，好像中共在改善啊，好像中共在变好等等。其实这一切都是中共对美国渗透的结果，不是中共的本来的面目。To fill the gap in knowledge, the victims of Communism Memorial Foundation prepared a curriculum dedicated to educating young Americans about communism. They also provide a national seminar for high school educators, an annual event in Washington, D.C. 
to provide professional development program to middle school and high school teachers. The program teaches the educators about the history and legacy of communism. Yeah, so the first edition was done in 2012. And we did a updated and slightly expanded second edition uh, in preparation for the first national seminar of high school educators. Uh, so that was about two years ago uh, that it was expanded. It's, it's intended to fill in all of those missing pieces that, that I was speaking of earlier. You know, that most of the uh, pro-socialist sentiment that's cultivated is by not addressing the evils of communism. There are about 3.6 million full-time elementary and secondary school teachers in America. This number is far greater than the attendees to the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation's annual National Seminar for High School Educators. Dr. Marie Bassett wishes to expand the size of the program in order to address the problem of the school curriculum. I mean, there's been a dedicated effort uh, amongst the left to have influence on the educational systems. Uh, you know, so there, there's the attempt and an understanding, actually, that uh, the culture will precede the politics and that education is one of the chief drivers of, of culture. Uh, you know, so the, the Marxist left uh, sought to change what was being taught in the schools by you know, basically getting jobs as professors in the teachers' colleges and then literally changing what's taught. Uh, you know, there, are, there are examples in the United States in leading schools uh, where you know, former hardcore Marxist domestic terrorists, members of the uh, Students for a Democratic Society, uh, who had engaged in, in domestic bombings in the United States, uh, someone like Dr. Bill Ayers, uh, you know, William Ayers, who was a professor at the University of Chicago, uh, you know, that they're being placed in charge of curricular development. And you know, they're, they understand that if they can shape the story in the correct way, if they can indoctrinate young people, uh, that the young people will become open to, to the ideas. I mean, all the polling data shows that you know, the faculty across pretty much every discipline skews very heavily towards the left. Uh, the overwhelming majority simply consider themselves to be liberals. Uh, and this is why I mean, the excesses of the Marxists on college campuses have, I think, provided uh, an opportunity. They've really you know, planted the seed for a unified front against them because they are totalitarians and they seek to make the university a terrible place for everyone, including the liberals. You know, so whether you're a conservative, a libertarian, a liberal, you know, these socialists on the campus, which are a minority, a small minority on campus, but incredibly vocal and also action-oriented, uh, you know, they're the ones who show up and protest speakers and try to shout them down. Dr. Bassett's comments sound quite heavy, but we believe if the full facts of socialism or communism is exposed, who would like to see America to embark on a journey to danger? And who would like to see America to become the next Venezuela? We hope learning the truth about socialism or communism can be a coolest thing for young Americans and the generations to come. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.